so in today's class we are going to look at chapter 11 and in this chapter 11 we are going to talk about uh, the waypoints transition between the waypoints how to decide the path from one waypoint to the other waypoint then Dubin's path and then finally we would look at the algorithms now again this topic is mathematically intense in other words you are going to see a lot of definitions uh, symbols and uh, related stuff that is that you will typically see in math literature uh, but to be honest with you the implementation is straightforward so i will try to give you more physical understanding of the math and the theory behind math and the theory so here is where we are so we are towards the end of the course we initially started with the uav unmanned aerial vehicles we looked at the fixed wing we looked at the dynamics we looked at how to design the autopilot then we looked at how do we implement a path following so for an example the path is already defined and what uav needs to do is follow the path and now what we want to do now is we have to implement one layer up and talk about uh, path management. Now path management is typically uh, the guidance strategies for going from one waypoint to other waypoint. And we will look at different algorithms that are used to achieve this. So once again, we are looking at the management of path. So we are looking over here. And the best way to learn this chapter and the, the previous chapter is by means of some exercises. So unfortunately, we don't have time to assign the homework or the quizzes, but uh, in your spare time, I would encourage you to take a look at the project given for these chapters and look at the MATLAB webinars. They talk about the implementation. So here is the problem that we want to solve. And please understand this problem is not just related or in relation with the UAVs. This could be a generic robotics problem. And some of you may see this problem as similar to the trajectory planning problem that we studied in robotics one. So for an example, if you have a robot arm and you want to go from certain point to a certain point, in the case of UAVs, it's like waypoint, going from one waypoint to the second waypoint. So waypoint are nothing but the north east down coordinates so and they are defined in the inertial coordinate system this is called the r to the phase three that means it's a three-dimensional uh, coordinate system so you have r cube any point in this space is defined or given as in terms of its north position east position and down position in inertial inertial coordinate so waypoints are always defined in terms of inertial coordinates and here is the reason why because you may be a, a operator located in uh, california uav is flying uh, in arizona so there is no way uh, to combine the coordinate systems, your coordinate system with the UAV coordinate system. So both of these should refer to a fixed 
inertial coordinate system. Only then you would have a, a proper definition of path. So waypoints are these points. So for example, this is the complete path. So we want our UAV to go from point one to point two, point two to point three, point three to point four, point four to point five, and so on. Now, what we want to do is, here is a simple problem. And as, a, as humans, we don't realize this problem, but as UAV, here is, or as a robot, for a matter of fact, if you consider a ground robot, or for that matter of fact, you consider an unmanned underwater robot, how does robot know that it has reached this waypoint? So for an example, you start here. So robot started over here. And how do we know, or how does robot itself know that it has reached this waypoint? And some of you may say, this seems like a trivial question. Don't we have the X, Y, and Z coordinates of W2, X, Y, and Z? And you are right that we know what are the X, Y, Z coordinates, and we can have some type of sensors in the robot that would give me the current X, Y, and Z coordinates. But please understand, robot is going to estimate its position based on some sensors, either a range finder or some sort of IMU or some sort of uh, maybe rate gyro. So it's never going to get this exact waypoint definition. So it will be always somewhere close. So what the, the mathematical way of defining this is you construct sort of a ball around that waypoint. And as soon as your coordinates or your uh, robot, uh, robot estimates that his current state, his or her robot's current state is inside this ball, then for the practical purposes, we think or we say that the robot has reached its second waypoint. And so now the next question is, is this the only way to, to do it? So no, there are different algorithms for doing that, but this is one potential algorithm that what you do is you construct sort of a unit ball around that waypoint. And as soon as the robot sensors indicate that robot is within that configuration space, then you say that the robot has reached the second waypoint. The other way it can be done is by means of waypoint switching. So we, a moment ago, we just talked about this ball. Alternatively, what we can do is we can construct sort of a half plane. And how do we construct this mathematical half plane? This mathematical half plane can be constructed by means of vector algebra. And what it means is you will have, you, when you look at the second waypoint, you will have some definition of the direction vector, and then you will construct a unit normal to that uh, overall plane. And then you will see where the location of UAV is, whether the UAV is on the left-hand side of the, the plane or on the right-hand side of the plane. So this is how you can actually decide where the UAV is. Now, unfortunately, again, some of you may obviously notice that if you want to design a path with this approach, there is no guarantee that the UAV will pass through that second waypoint. There is a possibility that the UAV can go through the ball at some other intersection. So UAV may cross the ball at some other point. So the question is, how would we make sure that UAV is as close to the, the waypoint that we want? The one thing is shrink the, the radius of the ball. But again, you don't want to shrink the radius of the ball so much that you 
the, the robot will never reach or theoretically will not be within that unit ball. So the next question that naturally arises is when you go to waypoint WI from I minus one, how do you transition? So basically, how do you go from here all the way over here? Please note, UAV cannot do an abrupt turn. For that matter, even the, the robots, ground robots, they have their own turning radius. So you need to actually implement some sort of fillet algorithm. Fillet algorithm. Now, what do we mean by fillet algorithm? And it is, if you think about it, when you, you are using a CAD geometry, when you are using a, a, a CAD software like SOLIDWORKS or AutoCAD, and say what you do is you draw these two lines and then you want to add a fillet. Then what you do is there are multiple ways to define the fillet. You can define the arc by three points. You can define the fillet by center and radius and so on. So there is a mathematical algorithm that works underlying this construction of fillet. So the same algorithm or similar algorithm that is used to construct a fillet in a CAD geometry is used to construct a fillet in a UAV design or a UAV path planning. So how does it work? So let's quickly look at the underlying math. Now, if you look at the underlying math, the half plane edge, and some of this math may look uh, uh, convoluted, but implementation is not difficult. So this is the mathematical basis for analysis. But then with this mathematical equations, what we can do is we can actually write a clean and neat MATLAB code or algorithm that will give us the appropriate results. So first and foremost, you can define a unit vector that gives you the direction of WI, WI plus one. And this is not difficult because if you think about the unit vector, you would have a sort of the Cartesian distance between these two divided by the, yeah, the, that to answer Borna's question, airframe, the UAV airframe should be able to make the desired turn. And that comes into the considerations when you are actually designing the turning radius for the fillet. So just to give you the idea of the math, so what you do is first and foremost, we define the unit vector. So if you think about this point as, as maybe X1, Y1, Z1, and you have this point x0, y0, z0, based on these two coordinates. So x1 is actually uh, the certain value five, or y1 is another value six, z1 is another value seven, and you have x0, y0, z0, say so zero, zero, zero. So we can construct a vector that is indicating the direction. Now what we do is, now to construct the 3D half plane, we construct something called as the unit normal. So this unit normal is a vector that is perpendicular to that half plane. And if you think about it, this is that unit vector. And then what we want to do is we want to make sure that the current direction of UAV is aligned with the unit vector that are pointing towards the waypoint. And then once the UAV reaches the waypoint, we realize that we have crossed this threshold. So there will be some sort of switching statement in algorithm that will ensure or that will check for this switch. So, here is the algorithm and the, the fundamental purpose of this algorithm is to follow waypoint from say one vector R to another vector Q. And what 
you are given is you are given the series of waypoints and the direction vector. Uh, so you have this P. These are the locations in north, east, and down coordinate system. And let's look at how would this waypoint following work in the case of three waypoints. We have one, two, and three. So first and foremost, we are going to find out the, the unit vector q i minus one. Then we will find out the second unit vector, which is q i. And then we will find out the normal. And then we will see if the val current value of p is well within the, so it is, so this symbol sin means consisting of, consist of. So if P is part of that plane, if it is contained in that plane, then what we do is we increment. If it's not, then what we do is we uh, return the values of R and Q that define the, the direction of travel and then increment in each step. So that way the UAV is going to go step by step, step by step, step by step over here till the second waypoint is reached. And please note, as waypoint is uh, reached, then the index uh, gets changed. And when the index gets changed, then the next set of waypoints will be followed. So if you were to construct the MATLAB simulation, and there is a, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the MATLAB code. There are MATLAB codes that will actually do this. So if you Google waypoint following uh, UAV MATLAB codes, they will actually give you this algorithm that is implemented as part of an M file. So if you define a path, so basically a straight line path, which if you think about it, the path is like this. So what you can do is you can define this path. And then once you run your algorithm, it will actually generate these different, different waypoints. And then it will actually show you how the UAV will travel. So, and if you are into PICHOC, PIX4, this is the autopilot. There is a ground station software that is open source and freely available. You can download the ground station, pick the waypoints in that ground station. And then actually you can ask the pick uh, the ground station, the program to simulate and it will actually show you the path that would typically be generated. The, uh, the path that uh, the algorithm would generate and the UAV should periodically follow. So we were just talking about the fillet transition and fillet transition is UAVs for that matter, uh, even quadcopters, they can do uh, uh, at the turn at the 0, 0 radius turn, but in general, uh, helicopters in general, uh, the fixed wing aircrafts, they need some finite radius of turn. So depending upon the airframe that we are looking at, we will have certain fillet radius that is to be implemented when we are transitioning from this uh, path all the way to this path. And the algorithm that actually does this, it's similar to the CAD algorithm that is used to construct the fillet between two lines. And the algorithm is purely based on the geometry. That means once you define the radius of the fillet, once you define the location of the center, what it is gonna do, it's going to construct a, a geometrical diagram and then write a mathematical function that would actually give you the, the fillet values. So, if you zoom in, this is how the fillet 
is going to look like. So R is the radius of the fillet. And then rho is the angle of the fillet. And once we define R, once we define rho, then we can find out the important parameters, important locations for the fillet. So now what we have here is we can identify the most important points that define this geometry. And from this geometry, we can construct the vectors that would help us get to those different, different points. So how do we construct those vectors? And again, don't think that this math is uh, intimidating. So the simple idea is once you have constructed the fillet radius, look at the, the coordinates. So you know what is the value of WI. You know what, so if this is the WI, then from the geometry, you can find out this location would be at WI plus R divided by tan rho by two or multiplied by QI. This geometry is going to be WI minus R divided by tan rho by two QI minus one. So in case if you are wondering what is QI and QI minus one, remember these are the unit vectors that we already calculated and we can calculate those easily because we know WI minus one and we know WI plus one. So what we can do is we can actually define the fillet radius, actual fillet radius in terms of V points. And then we can also define the half plane H1 by the location in terms of the vector R1, as we talked about, and we can find out the other normal vector, which is QI minus one. And we can define the half plane H2. So please understand this is the half plane H1, and this is the half plane H2. And please note that half plane H1 contains part of the fillet radius and the initial direction of the V points from WI minus one to WI. And H2 is the half plane that, cons that consists of uh, the part of the fillet radius and the, the direction in which the UAV needs to travel from waypoint I to waypoint I plus one. And whenever you construct a plane, uh, constructing a normal vector is very easy because the plane is defined, is defined by two vectors. And if you take the cross product of those two vectors, you get the vector that is perpendicular to these two. So just to give you an idea, so if you have two vectors, once you have two vectors, these two vectors define the plane. And when you take the cross product, you get a, a third vector that is pointing that completes the triad. So that is how we can find out the normal vector. So all said and done, this is the algorithm that you can implement either in C or in MATLAB. And I just want you to understand that even though it looks like the complicated WI is I minus one, I want you to think about it as just set of three numbers. So you have X, Y, Z positions for each waypoint and you know what should be the fillet radius or theoretical fillet radius. Then this algorithm, what it will do is, it will go through the initialize, first it will get the waypoint, initialize the index. This algorithm can be implemented in sort of a state machine or it can be implemented as if then type of statement. So first, you find out the, uh, the direction vector QI minus one, then find out the direction QI, and then you find out the value of rho. Rho is nothing but the angle between these two values. Some of you may ask me, how is this coming from? If you think about it, this is nothing but a very simple dot product 
uh, uh, implementation. So you have two vectors and you are taking the dot product and finding out the cosine inverse of the dot product and getting the answer. Uh, remember, the reason for that is the magnitude of QI minus one is one. Magnitude of QI is one because both of them are unit vectors. So the once you take the cosine inverse of the dot product, you are naturally going to get the value of the angle which is in between. Then what you do is you look at, you, if you see the state is equal to one or you can have an if statement, then you set up the flag and then you transition, you make R is equal to WI minus one, Q is equal to QI minus one and Z is, is equal to WI minus tan uh, R divided by tan rho by two QI minus one. Then you would want to check whether the point P is on the plane H1 or H2. So for that, you want to check where you are. And if you are in that plane, what you will do is you will change the state. If not, you will continue wherever you are. And then as soon as you change the state and you will implement you are in the state two, then straight up the flag and then you will proceed for finding out uh, the next. So first you will find this, continue, see whether you are, uh, you are crossing the plane. After you cross the plane, then you will see where you are. Are you crossing the plane H2? If not, you will continue on this path. Once you see you have crossed the H2, then you'll continue on this path. So if you were to implement, again, there is a MATLAB script we point uh, following with fillets, you would, I'm, I would encourage you to take a look at it. So once you define the MATLAB uh, uh, script and run, once you define the path inside the MATLAB script, you will notice that it will generate the fillets around this, which is similar, believe it or not, which is similar to how the SOLIDWORKS would do it if you ask SOLIDWORKS to generate a fillet between two intersecting lines. Now, the next question is, uh, how does it work when you have a path with no fillet? It means the sharp turn. And how does it work when you have the path with fillet? Sharp turn, which is two straight line path intersecting, cannot be achieved in practice. So even if your path is actually straight line path with no fillets, actual UAV is, we needs to have some finite amount of radius to turn. But if you look at the path length, this means the how much is UA, how much UAV needs to fly, how much travel UAV needs to do. So this is the, the, the basic definition of path length, which is nothing but you are going to find out the, the line distances between each uh, waypoint and then add those together. But if you look at the fillet, What's going to happen is in addition to the traveling between the paths, you will have to take into account the travel around the fillet. So this constitutes travel on fillet. So clearly the path length is going to be slightly more compared to the, the straight path. Okay, next part is interesting. And when things become interesting, uh, interesting things become mathematically complex. So I just want to tell you that Dibbins path is a very fundamental problem in path planning of robots. And this path planning problem is actually observed in UAVs, UGVs, and again, UUVs. So the discussion that I'm gonna talk about is generic in a sense that it is applicable to ground vehicles as well. So first and foremost, look at a two-dimensional vehicle. Aircraft is not sort of a two-dimensional vehicle. What it means is it does not actually constrain to travel in X and Y plane. But what we say, at least in this particular chapter, we are going to assume that the aircraft is flying at a constant altitude. So you can say it is at 2.5 degrees of freedom. So it's not constrained 
to travel uh, in x or in y direction but its z or the position is going to remain more or less constant so in that particular case you will have the velocity in the north direction velocity in east direction so this is velocity in the north direction velocity in the east direction and you can define the the u uh, which is nothing but the theta dot so you, you can define x position <clears throat> x velocity y velocity and the angular rate at which it's changing so this is the angular orientation or this is nothing but yaw rate of the vehicle yaw <clears throat> So we are, we are going to assume the velocity v is constant. And the idea is we want to find out a time optimal path between two different configurations. So think about this two different configurations. And Dubin's path is very particular about the way the configurations are specified. These two configurations have a circular arc followed by a straight line and concluding with a circular arc. So if you think about it, it's like this, it's like this. So you start with a circular arc, you continue with a straight line and then conclude your path by the circular arc. And the radius of the circular arc is V divided by U bar. And this equation, I, can, I want you to think about it is something similar to omega times r and omega is nothing but u so v divided by u is equal to r so this is the basic of fundamental dubin path definition so depending upon uh, how these are formulated so think about it there is a right hand side rotation there is a right hand side rotation and there is a left hand side rotation. So right hand side rotation is called R, left hand side rotation is called L. So if you look at this path, first there is a right hand side rotation turning straight and then again you have the right hand side rotation. This is case one. In case two, you have the right hand side rotation, straight travel, and the left hand side rotation. So that's why this is called RSL, RSR. Similarly, here, what you have is left hand side rotation going straight. And then finally, you have the right hand side rotation. Here, you have left hand rotation going straight. At the end, you have the left hand side rotation. So these Dubin path is nothing but out of these four configurations or out of these four cases, which is the shortest to go from point one to point two. So this is what is the definition of the Dubin span. Now, what we are gonna do is, uh, there will be some mathematical terms thrown at you, thrown at you but don't, don't get scared. This is essentially what we are trying to do is, we have position P. And when I say position P, think about X, Y, and Z coordinates in northeast down frame. And you have a radius and you have the course angle. So what I can do is I can project the radius in its cosine and sine components and find out the values of CR and find out the values of CL. So, CR is P, and if you think about it, which is uh, R uh, cosine, uh, you, are, you are resolving the, the radius vector into cosine and sine components, and you add those to the path. So that gives you the CR, which is the right-hand rotation. You can do the same thing, considering CL, which is the left-hand rotation, wherein the course angle is subtract pi by two, so that you can find the component on the left-hand side. And then what we do is we use 
this relationship we use this relationship which is the effective angle and find out the total arc length so basically the total arc uh, from point a then what we do is if you want to look at the counter clockwise same thing we find out the angle subtended by that arc then what we do is we look at the angular distances so essentially what we have done is when we looked at uh, the the total arc that is subtended then we are actually looking at how much of angular travel is really needed to to navigate to actually navigate that path so you can actually construct uh, the angles from purely geometry that's totally fine or you can use uh, the mathematical definition that we just talked about so next there are four cases and i'm not going to discuss the exact math behind these four cases but what i want you to tell you is here is the fundamental idea you are starting here you are ending here you are starting here you are ending here and i want to find out how much do i have to travel from here all the way over here so what is the total arc length if if i want to go from point s to point e and if i follow r s r path r s r path and this is nothing but as you can see it's just purely geometry radius multiplied by the angle so think about this as r times theta 1 r times theta 2 and then you have the total path length so once you look at the total geometry look at the angles it's not difficult to see that you find out r theta 1 r theta 2 and then find out the total path length same thing now you want you have the same problem going starting from pe ps and ending with pe but now i want to go in r s l pa so it's something like a hook so again you have to look at the arc the distance and the arc so again you have to say r theta 1 r theta 2 and then finally find the length and some of you may say wait a second wouldn't that be same and unfortunately the answer is no because if you look at the travel that is taking place from rsr and the travel that is taking from rsl the topology or the geometry is different so which means the path length is going to change so some of you may say hey uh, would that always be the same path length once i have ps and pe no it actually also depends upon the heading that you are commanding so basically or uh, the course angle that you are commanding so so basically uh, for given course angle for given uh, values of coordinates for ps and pe you would run that case to r first rsr rsl then again same thing r theta 1 r theta 2 and if you see from here you go straight and turn all the way over here and you can find out the l s r path and the last case is left straight left so you can go from here straight and turn here again the math the notations are different they are written like mathematics definitions but please understand this is nothing but r theta 1 r theta 2 and at the end what you have is you have the geometry so straight line so between the centers so this is the center distance so you have the center distance 
and this travel on the radius. So what you want to do is once you have some preliminary parameters, uh, like first uh, the position PS, position end position, start position PS, end position PE, then you have some constraint on uh, your uh, course angle. Then what you can do is you can actually run through the Dubin's path calculation in the MATLAB code and see which is the optimal path. So now for an example, so we are going to combine this Dubin's path with the switching. So here is the basic problem that I want to define. The problem is you have a start location. In other words, no, the Dubin cases are calculated in the, the path planning software, which is typically in the ground station. So they are not, Dubin cases are computed inside the IMU. Dubin cases are not computed in the real time. Dubin cases are defined or evaluated before the UAV takes, takes the path. Okay, so you have start location. So X, Y, and Z, you have a start direction. So you know where your UAV is headed at when it's going to start. You have an end location and you know where the end location, where UAV should be headed when it reaches the end. You don't want your UAV to go like this and at the end, so you, want, you don't want your UAV to be like 180 degree opposite. You want your UAV to go like this and then after all the path, you, you want your UAV still facing in the same direction. So this is front. You don't want this flip. If this is front, you want it something like this. So how do we find out Dubin's path parameters based on this? And here is the algorithm. The algorithm may look complex, but please understand there is a nice MATLAB script that will compute the Dubin's path parameters for you. So what you need to enter is start location, start direction, end location and end direction. And here is that algorithm that consists of 35 lines. First, it will, it will see if PS and uh, starting point and the end point, are they really far apart? Then it will look at the turning radius. So this is where to answer Borna's question, depending upon the airframe, it will make sure, or there will be some condition check that will make sure that R is greater than the minimum turn radius of MAV. Then it will find the circular path CRS, CLS, CRE, CLE. These are the, the circular paths, uh, left-hand rotation, right-hand rotation. And then it will find L1, L2, L3, and L4 using equation 11.9. And out of that, it will take the minimum value. And then once it's, it's done with minimum value, essentially it will implement the half plane algorithm that we talked about a few slides ago. So this is the same implementation wherein you are going to find Q, Z, Z2. Again, you will have two because you have now two points at the start and at the end. So you're gonna repeat the process twice and then continue through the same algorithm. Again, don't be scared with this algorithm. This algorithm is nicely implemented in the, the MATLAB code. So you are welcome to look at the webinar on Dubin's path, on UAV path following, and you will see the, the MATLAB code. Okay, uh, again, there is an alternate algorithm if you uh, want to do the path following with Dubin's. So, so this is computation of Dubin's parameters. And next implementation is if you want to follow this Dubin's path, what would you do? Again, same argument that you will track where the position is. You will look at the current Dubin path parameters. Then you will find out the, uh, the, the values of state you can implement a state machine and then recursively 
you will continue to find Dubin's path parameters as the UAV is traveling from one path to other path. Again, please understand path planning, just like everything else is not something like a spectator sport. Uh, don't expect that you will understand the algorithm just by someone explaining it to you. What you need to do is you need to get your hands on a MATLAB code and then implement that MATLAB code or provide input to the MATLAB code where the actual path is computed. And I have added links to codes and webinars on Canvas. So I would encourage you to take a look at uh, the webinar and take a look at the code. So if you were to do with Dubin's path, this is how the result is gonna look like. As you can see, this is different than the fillet. So in the MATLAB code, if you were to see that the difference here is start and end point, the heading direction or the orientation of the UAV is defined. So based on the heading direction that is defined, the Dubin's path parameters are computed and from there the waypoints are computed. And this is something that I was trying to talk about a little bit in the last class, but now I just want you to look at the information wherein if you have an airplane and that is actually doing uh, X, Y, and Z. So you have velocity in north direction, velocity in east direction, velocity in down direction, and you have the heading rate. And then how would it, this, this approach would work? Uh, this is actually not in the textbook, but this was published by the, the authors, uh, the basically uh, uh, implementing Dubbing airplane path for fixed wing UAVs. So I would encourage you to take a look at uh, this. If you are interested, once you master the, the basic Dubbing's path, I would encourage you to take a look at this. This is not given in the textbook. For that, you will have to refer to this paper that is mentioned over here, this paper. And then authors have extended the Dubin's path formulation implementation for the fixed wing that are climbing up. And then again, what they do is they again touch upon the three vector field path following that we talked about in last class a little bit. Again, this material is not in the textbook, but for that you will have to actually look at this paper that is authored by uh, uh, these uh, researchers. And they will talk about uh, how far the velocity vector is implemented and then how do you find out the various values of U and how do you had, uh, have a lateral dynamics stability? And then how is the all thing, this stuff is extended into topological uh, uh, concepts. Like now you are going to define the path that is an intersection of two planes. And then from that, how would you um, find out the various parameters and how would you implement that in, the, in a UAV frame? So path planning, topological based path planning is a very complex uh, topic and which is an active area of research. So I would encourage you if you are interested in looking at robot path planning, you can potentially do your entire PhD in topological path planning. So these are all topo topological techniques that are used for path planning. So I would encourage you to uh, look at these different uh, paths. And again, this can be generated very easily with MATLAB code. If you provide the initial and final positions and orientations, then it will con construct this Dubin's path. And there are slight variations of Dubin path when you have a drop in the Z direction. So here are the, the algorithms for the different altitude Dubin's path. And with that, we are done with chapter 11. And what I want to do is, I want to give you some hints on the, the project. So first and foremost, did anyone finish project eight? So,
project eight. Okay, any other comments? Okay. Actually, project eight is very straightforward. And um, I wish I could solve it, but it's so simple that um, I just want to tell you how to solve it. And then you are welcome to uh, take a look at it. So first and foremost, in project eight, you have sensors so basically sensors dot n file and you have a gps dot n file now here is what the sensors dot m file does you provide some input and we'll talk about what that input is and it gives you output but please note that this output will be corrupted. This output, the output, and the input. There is again input, and there is output. And for sensors, there is different input. For GPS, there is different input. Now, what it's going to do is, it's this output will not be accurate will it needs to be it will be corrupted so this output will be in and why it would be inaccurate because of the random noise because of the drift because of the errors same things gonna happen you're gonna have an input and gps there will be some gps errors and some inaccuracies or drift, so your output is corrupted. What this project is asking you to do is it is asking you first to implement the error models and the coefficients for random walk and coefficient for the drift and other parameters that are defined in appendix H. So let me look at appendix H. If you look at appendix H, there is all the sensor parameters are given. So for an example, H point H point one gives you the, the parameters for the read gyros. Similarly, H point two gives you for accelerometer. It gives you information, it gives you sensitivity information, it gives you, again, same thing, H3 gives you for the pressure sensor and it gives you for compass. Now, first step and H5 is for GPS. So what you need to do is, you need to implement H1 to H4 into sensors.m and H5 into gps.m. And what I'm gonna do is, I am gonna show you how it is implemented. And I realize that some of you might wanna take a screenshot of what I'm gonna show, but it's not the complete implementation. So what you want to do is, I'm gonna share my MATLAB screen and then I will show you that how it is implemented. Next, once you have these implementations done, remember we have a uh, maybe dynamics equation and we did that, then you have the forces and you have dynamics and then you have all the plots. So you have scope. So we have done this in the previous project when we trim the aircraft or we just simulate the aircraft. What we did, we finally, we ran the code, we added the integrator function and in simulating and we 
plotted all the state variables. So think about these as the state variables. And if you think about it, and I, I, this would be a good time to open up your trimming code. You got airspeed and all the stuff from your trim function over here. So in other words, in this problem, what you have is you have, think about it like you have, you have a plane, you have a Zagi plane. So you have this plane and this plane is flying. And from your simulation, you are getting the true values of all the states. Now, what are the states? States are PN, PE, H, which is PD. You have U, V, W, you have P, Q, R. So out of that, clearly, if you look at position, P, N, P, E, P, D, that is something that you can get from GPS. If you think about uh, P, Q, R, which are nothing but the rates that you can get from gyroscope. If you, ha you have U, V, and W, these are the velocities, which in other words, you got U dot, V dot, and W dot are nothing but accelerations. You can also find out heading and other parameters. So what is gonna happen is, this is important, you feed appropriate states. So for an example, if you're looking at gyro, you will feed the appropriate states, the sensor.m and see the output of the sensor.m. This would actually be the output of your sensors. Once again, I repeat, and I'll write this down. So step is, first step is run simulation, then get states and other variables. Third, feed appropriate streets. So states through accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, and the barometer, and GPS code. So this, this will be in sensors.m. This will be in GPS.m. And then last but not least, plot the output. Plot. plot. So what this plot would be, this will show you what your sensors will indicate. This plot will show you what your GPS would indicate. And this would be implemented in a simulink. So just to give you simulink here. So you will have MAV dynamics, you are gonna have an integrator, you are, you are gonna have force plus moment function. There will be some input to forces and moments. And then there will be something coming out from here. And there will be additional scope block over here. So what you will do is you will tap into this. and we'll construct a simulink user defined function using sensor.m. You will construct a gps.user defined function using gps.m and integrate these two functions with the input, which is nothing but your states that are coming from your simulation. Everyone understood? Are there any question here? Any questions here? No, you don't have to use MAVSIM from chapter seven simulation you actually can use 
math sim chapter 7 simulink but then you have to make additional changes to the code to get it working so if some of you want to work with math sim chapter 7 simulink go ahead but please understand the you will have to add all the parameters to the this math sim 7 that code but alternatively you can use the the code simulink code that we already have for trimming and just interface gps.m and sensors.m with that code and you should be able to get good results any questions here and to be honest with you i'm looking through the the design project nowhere it says that you have to use uh, maps in chapter 7 simulink No, how do we implement your code to the code in the website? It's not my code, it's gonna be your code. Yes, project full trim. So this is your project full trim. And what you need to do is interface gps.m user defined function and sensor.m user defined function to your trim i think it is project 4 correct me if i'm wrong project 4 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you a quick snippet i'm not going to show you the snippet of the whole thing working because to be honest with you this project is super simple once you know what needs to happen i will just show you the, the i'll discuss the inputs and the outputs to gps.m and sensors.m but yes and don't use my code use the code that you wrote yes Yes, and the reason our code is different than the website because they don't use the specialized toolboxes uh, that we have access to. They are trying to implement everything with the, the generic version of MATLAB. That's why their code is different. But we have the same functionality in our code. Okay. Any other questions before I show some uh, MATLAB demo? So let me show you what it will look like. So if you look at MATLAB, first and foremost, these are the parameters that you need to implement. So you have Sigma gyro, you have the bias gyro, so sigma gyro is the standard deviation, bias is the bias, then uh, of x, y, and z, all these come from the appendix H. Same thing with accelerometer, you have the standard deviation. This is uh, uh, interpreted as the noise. And then you have something similar for the barometer. So these are, the error models. Similarly, the GPS has these different parameters and these are parameters in that short paragraph, all these parameters are defined. So if you read that appendix, if you go back to text, you should be able to find out all these parameters that are needed 
to define GPS error model. Uh, if you have any question, just use the, the chat window. Okay, the next part is gps.m. I want you to look at typically what would be the inputs that you will provide to the GPS function so that you will get an output from the GPS. To get, so to begin with, what I want to show you is, and you can write this code differently, you need to supply the value of VA, you need to supply value of omega n, you need to supply value of, omega, uh, sorry, WN, WE. Then you have to substitute or supply the values of positions PN, PD, and PE. And then you have to specify the yaw angle, psi. And then finally you need T. So these are the inputs to your GPS function. And some of you may ask me, wait a second, where did I get these input functions from? So these input variables come from the, the chapter where they talk about what it is. Next thing is using the definition of sensor GPS. So the parameters, we are defining the, the values for noise. So as you can see, there is this GPS sigma, uh, north, uh, uh, direction, in each direction, and in the D direction. That is the value of sigma. Then what we do is we take this information, which is nothing but uh, typically the error. This is the error in the north position, error in the east position, and then error in the, uh, the down position. And then you can add these to your values of GPS. This is the corrupted output of the GPS. So these are the states that you are gonna obtain from your trim simulation. And you are gonna add these errors to that and you will get a GPS uh, uh, corrupted output or inaccurate output. And then with this, you are able to go forward. Now, since VA is the the input to the function, which is the airspeed, you can add wind in the north direction, wind in the east direction. Remember, you get these from your wind models. And then you can find out Vn and Ve, which is the velocity in the north direction, velocity in the east direction. And your GPS velocity is going to be square root, uh, actually the, the magnitude of these guys, plus the error that you computed. This is going to be your uh, velocity indicated by the GPS, ground speed indicated by the GPS. How do you find the course angle? The course angle you will find out from A tan 2. Again, you have two vectors and then you will add your random uh, noise to it. And at the end, you will send your output. Output of GPS is GPS position in north direction, GPS position in east direction, GPS position, position, position in down direction and the velocity in the, or the ground speed and the course angle. So this is what your function would look like. And you would integrate this function with your code, the Simulink uh, code for trim. Let's look at how would your sensors.m look like. If you look at sensors.m, you have all the variables. So PN, PE, PD, U, V, W, phi, theta, psi, P, Q, R, F, X, F, Y, F, Z, M, L, M, N. And then at the end, you have V, A, alpha, beta, or the, and the wind speeds. So please understand, V, A, alpha, beta, they come from the output of forces and moments block. And these are actually part of the original simulation. The top 12 variables are part of the original simulation. And all the forces, they come from the force and moment block and then the output of the force and moment block, you have the airspeed and everything. Here, what you're gonna do is, you are going to define the gyro 
same thing you have p is the body rate in x direction q body rate in y direction r body rate in z direction plus the gyro errors plus gyro errors in y plus gyro errors in z this gives you corrupted or incorrect gyro measurement so if you were to sense it if you were to sense this p this is what you will see if you have if you have a gyroscope if you want to measure what is this q this is what you should get if you have a gyro in um, z direction then this is the output then same thing but in the case of accelerometer remember you are finding the specific force so force in the x direction divided by mass gives you acceleration plus component of gravity plus the sensor error force in the y direction divided by mass minus component of gravity plus errors in the in the sensor in y direction force in the z direction divided by the mass of the uh, aircraft minus the the component of gravity plus the errors in the acceleration and this gives you the the corrupted accelerometer measurements in x y and z direction same thing for static pressure you are going to have static pressure this equation comes from the equation given in the book mav rho this is the rho of air density gravity this is pd which is the height plus the random uh, variation or the error in sensor and then same thing with the differential pressure you are going to differential pressure is computed as one half m va square va is nothing but the air speed square so this is not this is the dynamic pressure one half rho v square plus the error in the differential measurement and what would come out of your imu block or sensors block it will, it will give you uh, the the corrupted gyro measurement in y, x direction corrupted gyro measurement in y direction corrupted gyro measurement in z direction corrupted accelerometer measurement in x direction corrupted accelerometer measurement in y direction corrupted accelerometer in z direction and your y static pressure and y differential pressure all these actually these two blocks gps.m and sensors.m you will have to construct a user defined function and integrate with your existing project i'm going to stop here and uh, if there are any questions i would be happy to answer and i will upload these uh, video lectures uh, this video lecture uh, by tonight so if you want to follow what i have done as the reference you are welcome to use it you are welcome jacob any other question we are doing the chapter so kind of m file from scratch not scratch those values are given to you in appendix h i know somebody will ask me can you give me parameters chapter 7.m but the answer to that question is unfortunately no so you will have to dig through those parameters from Uh, appendix h and implement the error model or uh, i think some of you might have taken picture or uh, of the matlab code that i showed for parameter chapter 7.m or you can watch the video lecture freeze it and then rewrite parameter for chapter 7.m from the the screen Yes, you are welcome. I'm sorry, I don't want to be uh, uh, too difficult, but this is the last project. So, I really, really hope that you will challenge yourself and then uh, get it working. You're hey, welcome. Any other questions?
and please note that i have extended the deadline for project 8 